here is the deal. You don't have a choice. Whether you like it or not, in the following years, you and your business will have to face more change, more disruption, more crisis than ever before. The only choice you have is this, whether you will fight change, whether you will see it as your enemy in a desperate attempt to hold on to your past, or you choose to embrace change and make it your biggest opportunity. It's simple. My own relationship to change started long before I was born. I am from Kazakhstan, and in the late 1920s, early 1930s, the government of Soviet Union engineered an artificial famine that killed 40% of our country's population. 40%. That's nearly 2 million people. My great-grandfather survived the famine, but being an outspoken critic, he was arrested, tried and the enemy of the state and executed. Same happened on all sides of my family, and I barely know a family back in Kazakhstan that doesn't have a similar story. So when I was growing up, my parents prepared me to be the kind of person who is ready for any kind of disruption. And boy, the disruption showed up. In 91, the Soviet Union collapsed, Kazakhstan was not at all prepared. It took us three years to develop our own currency. That's how unprepared we were. And that's when I discovered my profession. I became a person who professionally helps others survive. And when your profession is survival, dealing with disaster, that becomes a big, endless study of every kind of disaster that you can possibly find in history books. So today I want to share with you a story of one disaster, perhaps one of the most famous disasters in the world's history. You know the story very, very well, but I hope I will share some new elements of that story, some new insights that will help you prepare for crisis, change, new things in your life that can help your families, your communities and your companies. Of course, I'm talking about the Titanic. You all remember the story, the movie? Uh, the, yeah. So the story is very famous. In April of 1912, just around midnight, a wonderful ship, the largest moving man-made object at that time on planet Earth, collided with an iceberg and sank within three hours, killing more than half people on board. And the real question for us as we look at the story is, what killed the Titanic? I know you have many answers to this question. I want to offer you three stories, three elements, three key insights, and I hope you will recognize those stories in your life as well. So here's story number one. On the night of the collision, it was a very quiet, very clear night. And above the deck, about 50 meters, 50 feet, 15 meters, there was an open area, a crow nest, they call it, where two people, two crew members, were working their night shifts. Their job was to be a lookout, to notice what's possibly um, interrupting the Titanic's path. They just started their shift. They were not drunk, they were paying attention, and they were not tired. So why didn't they notice the iceberg on time? Well, in their crow's nest, they had a bell to ring to draw the attention. They had a telephone to get directly to the captain's bridge. But there's one thing they didn't have, binoculars. Can you imagine a ship even today, more than 100 years later, without binoculars on board? Of course not. Even with all the technology we have, every ship still to this day has binoculars. So where were binoculars on Titanic? Well, the ship had binoculars, but they were locked up. They were locked up, and the key was not on the ship. How did that happen? 
a senior officer had the key to the cabinet, but was asked to sit out the trip in the last minute. So when he was leaving the ship in a big hurry, he forgot to pass on the key. It was later sold at an auction for huge money. So you have the binoculars. They are in the cabinet. You can break the cabinet. Why didn't they break it? Titanic had a vision of itself of being untouchable, unsinkable. The ship that is so mighty that nothing can possibly bring it down. So why would we bother breaking a cabinet? In this case, this was, in quite direct sense, blinding overconfidence. Later, when one of the surviving lookouts was asked in court, does he think anything could have prevented the disaster, he said, well, binoculars for sure will allow us those important seconds to avert the iceberg. And today, as I enter companies, communities, uh, countries, I'm surprised how often I see businesses that have no binoculars, that are not looking out too far outside of themselves, that are not looking and paying attention to the new opportunities. Story number two. The Titanic had one of the best radio equipment on the planet at that time, the newest technology available. And they had wonderful radio operators who were diligent and committed. They also had many, many ships in the area that were sending them warnings, saying there are icebergs on the way. Why didn't Titanic pay attention to the warnings? The court documents show that the radio operators were extremely busy. What were they busy with? They were sending messages for the first-class passengers. And there were not important messages. When you read the core documents, there are messages such as, alert everyone who is interested in a poker game. Order flowers for lunch, we're arriving tomorrow. When a passing ship was trying to warn Titanic of the incoming iceberg, the radio operator literally said, shut up, keep out, I'm working first class passengers. Customer service is all the range. But when you pay attention to the wrong thing, killing it for your customer might actually kill your business. Story number three. At the moment of the collision, the captain was already asleep. That was normal. He had to have a normal working hour. So it was First Officer Murdoch who was at the wheel. First Officer Mur Murdoch was 39 years old. He was very, very famous in the industry. What was he famous for? Averting collisions. In his career, he's done many cases. He worked many ships where ships were saved because he was so good at averting collisions. Right before Titanic, he was working the Arabic, another big liner, and another ship emerged in darkness and he was able to save the Arabic within only a few inches of the other incoming ship. So he knew very well, very well, how to avert collisions. So at the night of the Titanic collision, he did everything his best practice, his best experience taught him to do. He turned the wheel and he exposed more of Titanic to the iceberg. A number of experts suggest that if he just let it run straight into, the ship would be damaged, but it probably would not have those five compartments damaged. If you remember, Titanic could only survive if four were damaged. We adore best practices. We love our past successes. But what worked for you in the past might actually be what kills you today. Past experience is all the range until it destroys your business and destroys your life on the way. Now, as I share this story, you're probably wondering why am I not speaking about the most obvious reason for the death of Titanic, the iceberg. It's so tempting to blame the iceberg. Don't we all love blaming the iceberg? It's the competitors. It's the freaking suppliers. It's my parents. It's my government, it's the media, it's whoever. 
it's so, so tempting to blame the iceberg. But icebergs will come and go again and again. And your job is not to blame them, but to prepare. Titanic was not. I'm telling you the story of a hundred years old, and you would assume that by now we learned every lesson. We studied it to death, literally and figuratively, and we already know how to apply those lessons. Unfortunately, more often than ever before today, the mighty titans of business are following the exact path of the Titanic. If you look at the original Fortune 500 list that was established in 1955, today, 89% of those titans of business are gone. I just finished reading a new study from 2018 that says 50% of all standard poor 500 will be gone in the next 10 years. Titanics are falling to the floor of the economic ocean again and again. It's a long, big graveyard. So today, it's more important than ever to bring back the awareness that there is a big epidemic of titans coming our way. This is what I call Titanic Syndrome. Titanic Syndrome is a corporate disease where companies, organizations, communities, and countries bring about their own downfall through arrogance, excessive attachment to the past, or simple inability to recognize the new and emerging world. Titanic Syndrome is killing companies, it's killing careers, it's killing entire communities. A lot of the political unrest that you see all around the world today are the leftovers of the death of the titans. When people no longer have the support and they don't understand how to survive, how to make it out alive. And when we study why is it happening that today more often titans of business are going to the floor, we recognize it's because they don't understand that the rules of the game are changing. And they have to do with acceleration. Every year we research, thousands of people help us understand how often do you need to change something in your company, in your community, in your career to survive. These are results of 2018. How often do you need to change to survive? More than 13% every year more than 33% every two to three years. This is the speed we're simply not prepared for. So again and again, companies assume that they have time, that they have time to parade around their mighty, arrogant, untouchable selves, until it's too late. The question for us is, what's the alternative? What can I do? to prevent the plight of Titanic Syndrome. How do I notice it in myself? How do I notice it in my company? How do I notice it in my family? I often think that if I study this work, I should be the one who is completely immune to the case of Titanic Syndrome. I notice very often, ah, I'm developing a bit of arrogance today. I think I need to treat and prevent this before it kills me. This is the issue. How do we understand the essence of Titanic Syndrome? What's behind this disease? And the surprising thing, if you undo and unpeel all of the arrogance of Titanic Syndrome, you will recognize that the essence of it is really all about change. Nobody who is truly confident, safe, secure, need to be arrogant. When you're truly sure in yourself, you don't need to pretend. You don't need to blow up your ego. You don't need to show your brand as if it's untouchable and unsinkable. When you're truly confident, when you're truly sure, arrogance disappears. Arrogance is fear covered up. Fear of change. So today, I invite you to rethink your relationship with change. Change is very hard, annoying, and most of the time, it's change we don't want. But change is also an opportunity. It's a beautiful opening. 
It's a chance to let go of things that no longer serve you. It's an opening in your life to imagine a new version of yourself. It's an opportunity to discover a new and better way. It's a chance to rethink, reimagine, recreate, reinvent. So I hope I can give you one challenge. As you're coming home tonight and having a dinner conversation, it's a beautiful celebration today as well, so perhaps a big dinner party somewhere. Ask yourself, what is one thing I can do to develop a healthier, happier, a more productive relationship with change? Because when you invite change in your life, when you allow yourself to reinvent, you earn the right to choose a new option. Change is not the enemy. It's a beautiful freedom to make any choice you want. Thank you very much.